So this is the chapter 11 lecture over brass instruments. Um, this is a very short, uh, a very, very short chapter content wise. Um, part of it is because it's very similar in concepts to stuff we covered with the woodwinds. And uh, on the lecture page, I've got five videos up. Um, I would say four of the five are very, very useful. And then the fifth one, which is the how it's made, which I think is actually fourth in the order that they're on the page. Um, that's just more for interest. So you can see how a French horn is made. Trumpets would be made very similarly. Trombones would be slightly different because they don't have any valves. Um, but it gives you an idea of all that goes into that. So the very first video on the page is not something that's technically referenced in the, uh, in the chapter itself, but I think it's good to start off by looking at that before I actually get into the slides, um, because they're ultimately they're going to be, uh, well, really there's one major factor that, you have some control over with a brass instrument, and that is the effective length of the instrument. Um, because you buy a particular trumpet, trombone, they have a certain kind of natural length, and that length determines to a large degree what note they play. Um, because we're talking about tube resonators, just like in the chapter with woodwinds. But, um, when you're dealing with brass instruments, you can either control the length directly with a slide like a, uh, like on a trombone or with the tuning slide on something like a trumpet. Um, or you have to change the note some other way. And something that naturally happens is the temperature changes, the humidity changes, and so the speed of sound will change with those variables. Um, what this means is if you don't build in a certain amount of tuning flexibility into the instruments, if you play on a winter day ver winter's day versus a hot summer day, this, the instrument will sound different because of the different speed of sound. Um, and so that first video greatly exaggerates that effect by playing uh, brass instruments through uh, helium, which has a much lower, uh, much higher speed of sound than air because it's much less dense. And they also play it through uh, uh, sulfur hexafluoride, that was what the gas is, which is much heavier than air and so it ha sound has a lower speed of sound in it. And so in that first video, you can see that when they introduce the different gases and the speed of sound changes, the, the uh, pitch of the instrument changes substantially. Now this is greatly exaggerated over anything that you'll naturally run into just due to temperature, but it's exaggerating it for effect. So um, some older brass instruments things like old bugles and things like that, they have a fixed length. And so they are going to, if your conditions change, they're gonna sound slightly different because of that speed of sound change. And there's not really a whole lot you can do to, to change that. And that's why a lot of the modern brass instruments will have tuning slides built in so that you can adjust for uh, some variables when that comes into play. That's why a lot of flutes have the ability to tune um, and other woodwinds are also fall victim to this same circumstance. So that first video is just kind of interesting viewing. It kind of goes over both chapter 10 and 11. But now we'll actually get into the brass instruments. And so When we produce sound in brass instruments, uh, I'm not a brass player, so I can't tell you all the ins and outs. People who are uh, 
trumpet players, trombone players, they know all the tricks, just like um, in the previous chapter, if you play flute, some of that stuff is natural to you and it does, it may not uh, have registered why these things happen. I can only come at it from the pure theory perspective of how things should work. So where our sound comes from in, uh, in brass instruments is the buzzing of the lips when you blow air through your lips and into the mouthpiece, your lips are effectively acting like a double reed. And so when you're blowing air through, uh, you push the air out and when it rushes past your lips, your lips will close to cut off that airflow. And so that on off, on off airflow gives you the vibrations that we need to feed into the actual instrument. And that thus we end up with resonance and feedback in the instrument itself, hear the resonances that occur in the instrument, and then we get out sound. Um, some interesting thing about this, uh, if you watch the second video on the page, this is a uh, made by a trumpet maker and a classic trumpet not not like a modern trumpet with valves and everything but much more in line with uh the oldie trumpets that would play when the royalties coming around but i'm sure they make modern trumpets as well um this guy is a trumpet maker in england and he made a essentially a mechanical tongue kind of um but the interesting thing about it is he has closed off the path of the air from his lips so that the air is forced out the side of the mouthpiece, but there's a flexible membrane so that the vibrations from his playing can still make it to the body of the instrument. And so what, what this means is it's not the actual airflow through the instrument that is getting um, enhanced. It's the reflected sound waves that come about from the buzzing, the sounds that the frequencies that are available in the buzzing lips as you, as you make that noise and feedback in the instrument. You don't actually have to blow through the instrument to get a resonance if you've got a flexible membrane that can transmit those vibrations into the body of the instrument. And so that's what's going on in the second video. Um, so what is going to be selectively enhanced? Well, we're kind of still looking like looking at a closed tube system because remember our reeded instruments when we talked about woodwinds, they were um, they were like closed tubes, and so. In this case, we're still running into that effect. Now, the length of your tube is going to choose basically the fundamental frequency. Uh, the shape will choose the the shape will choose the harmonics that are available. Now, most of our modern brass instruments are actually cylindrical bore instruments for the most part, and so what that means is they are based off of the whole odd harmonic, odd harmonic only series. However, adding the mouthpiece and adding the flare or the bell end of the instrument actually adjusts those, uh, adjusts those harmonics quite a bit. And so we have a weird kind of hybrid two, three, four, five harmonic system that comes about in modern brass instruments. And we'll get into that. What this means is that the apparent fundamental of that harmonic series is not really playable by the instrument. It's actually below where uh, a resonance can be set up in the tube. And so there are pedal tones which are similar, that which are uh, lower than the natural notes of the instruments in a brass instrument, but they're really not completely related 
exactly to the harmonic series. And we'll see that the lowest note that you play is not exactly the harmonic that you would expect based on the length of the instrument. Now, um, as an example of something that's slightly different, if you look at the last video that compares a trumpet and a cornet, which are very similar in shape, construction-wise, they look very similar, their length is kind of the same, but the one fundamental difference between a cornet and a trumpet is a cornet is a conical bore instrument, while a trumpet is a cylindrical bore. And as a result, they sound different, even though they look very similar. Um, and naturally, that comes about just because the conical bore, instead of making only the odd harmonics available from a close to, means that we have all the harmonics available. And so naturally, it's going to sound different uh, when it's all put together. So if we started out and we wanted to model a brass instrument, so what we would do is we would take a just a cylindrical tube of a certain length. And if you buzz your lips into that cylindrical tube, um, it behaves like a closed tube with the lip end closed, the far end open. And so the fundamental frequency and odd harmonics are uh, all that should really be present. Now, this is not exactly what we end up with in a modern brass instrument because we still have the mouthpiece to worry about. That changes things. We still have the bell end to worry about. That changes things. So when we add the mouthpiece and the bell, um, one thing we do as a result is we slightly increase the effective length of the tube because we're adding pieces onto it. Um, it also will make the tube behave more like an open tube. And it's only approximate because it's only a handful of notes that in the harmonic series, or a handful of notes that it plays that will end up in a harmonic series. Um, and so what you end up with, instead of just one, three, five, seven, you end up with a two to three to four to five ratio where the, the fundamental of this two, three, four, five series is missing and it's incredibly difficult to play. So this is, uh, this slide is showing essentially what you end up with, um, for the, pressure waves when we are looking at kind of a modeled uh, modern brass instrument. Here's our mouthpiece, here's the actual pipe, and then our bell. So within the uh, mouthpiece, we have our, our pressure node. It starts to diminish a little bit, then we go through the actual mouthpiece itself. Here's our pressure node. Uh, for the wave that's been transmitted into the cylinder. And then we hit our uh, pressure, I said pressure node, I meant anti-node. Uh, we hit our pressure node out here where it hits the, uh, hits the atmospheric pressure. And so here's the second note that's played. And you'll notice here the one thing that's different is where this pressure node actually occurs. So here, the effective length is much shorter than here. And then as you go further out, that effective length becomes a little bit more consistent. But these lower frequency notes essentially bounce back sooner. Um, and what that means, that's what helps set up this uh, harmonic series that we end up with. Without them seeing effectively different lengths of tubes, then we wouldn't end up with the series that we were expecting to. So figure A here is referring to the first thing we talked about, single tube, you're buzzing your lips into one end of the tube. 
and we just end up with a pure um, pure harmonic series with only odd harmonics expressed. The uh, second one is where we end up with uh, where we end up with adding the mouthpiece. And the effect here is it's going to pull those low frequency harmonics up preferentially. You'll notice seven, nine, and 11, they don't really move a whole lot. Seven moves a little bit. Nine and 11 don't move at all. Five moves up a little bit. Three moves up a, a fair amount more. And one in, moves up more. And then C is, so this uh, A is just the tube. B is tube and mouthpiece. C is tube, mouthpiece, and bell. And so what the bell does is because those higher frequency notes see an effectively longer tube, um, what you end up with is the higher harmonics here get shifted down in frequency more than the uh, lower harmonics. You'll notice one, three, and five don't move a whole lot. Seven, nine, and 11 do. And what this ends up giving us when all is said and done is over here where our playable notes were one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. Here we have two, three, four, five. These line up almost exactly. Six is pretty close, but it might be a touch sharp. Um, and then where the fundamental should be to this series it's not really there because the lowest playable note down here, which this note would be your pedal tone, not the one, it's actually flat of where the apparent fundamental of this harmonic series is. And so when we're dealing with a brass instrument that doesn't have valves or slides, if you want to play different notes, you basically have to play different harmonics. Uh, and that's all you can do. Um, so to give modern brass instruments more range, they came up with ways that you could change the effective length of the tube with valves or with a slide, and that gives you the ability to play many more notes. So when we're talking about the acoustics of a brass instrument, the bell is one of the most important things because the bell affects those high frequency harmonics. And it also um, makes the instrument a lot louder. If you didn't have the bell end on the instrument, if you just have the uh, tube ending there, not only would you still be closer to that only odd harmonic series, you would also end up just not producing a whole lot of sound. And that's something that when you watch the uh, hornpipe video, which I should have mentioned before I came onto this slide, um, that is a guy that basically just took uh, a garden hose and then put a mouthpiece on it at some point. But he's a horn player. He shows that if you take just a length of hose, you can buzz in it, you can make some noise with it. Then he puts his mouthpiece in and makes a bell out of a uh, funnel and, and various things that he has in his garden to show that they get louder and it also changes the timbre of the instrument once you add that bell piece. So that's a really good video because it shows how all those things kind of feed into one another to change from just a, just a tube to something that is uh, more akin to a modern brass instrument. So the bell enhances the coupling of your standing weight inside the instrument to the exterior room, which we call impedance matching. And mainly this makes the instrument louder. So the big flare makes it so that you can move more air effectively and moving air more effectively means you get a louder instrument as a result. Now the bell shortens the effective length of the instrument for low frequencies. And so what you end up doing is those high frequencies are more affected ultimately when we do this. Um, 
and you end up with the second harmonic of the open tube series, slightly higher than the third harmonic of the closed the uh, closed tube series, and those two things end up matching each other fairly well. Now, for a valved instrument like a trumpet or a French horn, um, what we have are three valves. The middle valve increases the length of the instrument by about 5.95%, which happens to be right on one half step. The first valve increases by 5.9% and then increases that by another 5.95%, sorry, increases the length by another 5.95%, which gives you 12.25% for two half steps. And then the third valve increases the length by 18.9%, which is three half steps. So when you press a valve on a trumpet or a French horn, you add length to the instrument, which means you pitch down a half step. And so valves in combination with playing those harmonics that are naturally available to you in the instrument are how you get all the notes in the scale. So they show here for a trumpet val uh, trumpet valve combination. If you want to play the uh, the first note with uh, in your scale, you start with uh, with no valves closed. Then you go up a half step, which is your middle valve. Then you're up a whole step, which is your first valve, and then your minor third, which would be three half steps, is one plus two, or you could play three technically there as well, but from what I understand, that's typically not done because the one plus two valve gives you a better um, a better match to where that note actually should be. Uh, the minor third is down uh, down five. Sorry, this is three half steps, so this would be four half steps and that gives you that's your half step plus three half steps perfect fourth is one plus three so this is two half steps plus three and then to get down a whole augmented fourth that's all three of them at the same time now um, with a trombone you actually just slide your trombone in and out so when it's all the way in, that's the highest note that you can play. And as you progressively slide out the slide on the trombone, you're adding more and more length. And that naturally is going to increase the pitch as well. Uh, sorry, decrease the pitch in the same manner that pressing a valve on the trumpet decreases the pitch. Um, you have a lot more control here because you can do in between notes technically if you want to, uh, whereas with a trumpet, you're restricted to only those segments of tubing that you can add. So one of the problems that you run into when you uh, are using the valves is that uh, when you have that first and second valve played together to get your uh, three half step, you increase the length by about 18.2%, which means your pitch ends up slightly sharp. Um, first in the third valve uh, together ends up a, even a bit sharper than that, sharp by almost one sixth of a half step. And so there are ways you can fix this uh, sharpness is to mistune your third valve or what's more commonly done is just to add a slide to the third valve so you can change the length of the tube added by that third valve and kind of tune that in. So by sliding out a little bit more, you can pull the frequency down just a touch and fix issues with the pitch. And realistically, we're done. That's, that's all there is for val uh, brass instruments. So, um, this was only like a 10 slide lecture. Uh, you can watch the videos as well to fill in and don't really have a whole lot more to add. 
So this is this one. Um, the next one's also fairly short, but I'll probably be able to talk a bit more on it because I was a string player. So then that's that's where our next uh, our next one is going. I'll be talking about like the cello violin family. Um, I'll probably have that one up the Monday after next, but I might get it up sooner just because this one was so short. And I guess that's about it. If you haven't taken your tests, when, when you see this, if it's still Monday, um, get in there and do that because I might be willing to give you another day, but um, I specifically wanted it to run basically just over the weekend, but I added a day because uh, we would have been closed Friday through Sunday uh, if the campuses were actually open and we were still meeting for classes. This week is the spring holiday week. So I didn't want to make it due over the weekend when technically we would have been closed to begin with. So um, right now I have it closing Monday but I'll see where it is. Probably close to half the class is taking it as of this morning, or maybe closer to a, eh, a little bit more than a third, somewhere between a third and a half had taken it. Um, so yeah, get that done. And the next one will be coming soon. So have a good day and uh, be back soon with more.